today's Animal Spirits is brought to you by Cadre. A couple weeks ago, Michael and I had Cadre co-founder and CEO Ryan Williams on our podcast to discuss the commercial real estate market. Michael and I, we talk a lot about the residential housing market, and Ryan made a really good point that commercial tends to lag the residential real estate market, right? And it's I think, think it's something people aren't talking about as much anymore. And the only thing we really talk about, I guess, is big cities having dying commercial real estate markets, right? But well, Ryan, also because 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 uh, residential is sucking all the oxygen out of the real estate room. It's all right. It's like it's a huge story. We're yes. going to talk about it today. Yes, we're going to talk a lot about it. But he's saying, listen, everyone that we talked about residential real estate is saying the southeast and the southwest, where people are going because it's more affordable and there's better weather and there's jobs and all this stuff. And Ryan is saying that's where you need to go for commercial real estate too, right? He, he was saying why those mm. places are so much more appealing. So go back and check out our talk your book with Ryan Williams. I think that was the middle of February, so just a couple weeks ago. And go to cadre.com to learn more about investing in private commercial real estate. Welcome to Animal Spirits with Michael and Ben. Michael, I had an epiphany over the weekend a little bit. Oh, yeah? It just, well, just, just kind of a, a wow. Like, this whole growth stock sell-off in the stock market is really starting to feel very real for how long it's gone on for. <laughs> and I was just just the length, right? The length of time. Oh, it's real. I, but so I was writing a piece and kind of trying to compare it. You know, I think everyone compares everything now to that dot com period for tech stocks because the everything got so crazy and people want it to be like that. It's we're not there from in terms of like the the rise up never got there. So I looked the Nasdaq from ninety five to ninety nine was up forty one percent per year. It's like almost five hundred percent in total. But from 2017 to 2021, 25% per year for the NASDAQ. So it wasn't there. The analogy I made, it wasn't in the ballpark, but it was in the parking lot, right? It was, it was pretty close. Mm -hmm. And I think that this crash, it's not as bad as the crash was back then. And obviously, it still could go further, but it's close. Like, this is not 2018. Like, 2018, when stocks fell off, and of course, even in 2020, tech stocks got dinged, but most of them now have bigger drawdowns than they did back then. And so, I don't know. I, I Someone sent me a tweet that I did in like mid-February 2021, which is basically the, the peak of it. And I said, like showing how much the stocks were up from the bottom, like the NASDAQ 100 was up 100% from the bottom at that point. And it's like, this is why everyone feels like a genius right now, which was kind of a top for those markets. But even though everyone, and I say everyone in quotes, kind of said like, this is going to end badly. We know, like everyone kind of thought this could happen. I don't think it's necessarily played out like I would have thought it would. With the market still holding up relatively well and all these like brand name growth stocks getting just taken to the woodshed. So it's it started with the zooms of the world, right? Like the biggest darlings during the pandemic, which really f everything up by the way. For yes. like for so many lives obviously, but I'm just talking about for 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 investments. Just really like why why is PayPal getting killed so badly? I don't, I don't, I really don't know. I added this up. So Facebook, Netflix, Shopify, PayPal, Zoom, and Square. Six pretty big stocks. Like Facebook is the only one that was really in that top echelon. These, these are like the next level stocks. They've lost more than $1 trillion in market cap in the last year. If you go from their peaks in 2021. I mean, in a little less than a year, these companies have just gotten, what I mean, PayPal, you said it's totally round tripped. One of the charts of the year was... Exxon Mobil briefly being surpassed by Zoom. It's now, Zoom is now a tenth of the size, which makes a lot more sense. But if you look at, there's like, Jeez. there's so many fun charts that you could do with this. But Zoom, for example, comparing it to uh, Hilton, right? So Hilton, as you know, is a hotel. And hotels, uh, their traffic basically went to zero. And their stocks got destroyed during the pandemic. It's now round trip that since the start of the pandemic, Hilton is outperforming Zoom. So you have this How? chart here. Is that is that from the bottom, basically? No. The start of this no. chart? No, 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 no. If it was starting from the bottom, it would look way way better. This is pre-pandemic. Oh, pre-pandemic. Okay, so including so Zo including Hilton getting kneecapped and including Zoom's run-up. Okay, so it's funny. So, yeah, okay, so this is pre-pandemic. They're both up 40% in total. But at one point, you were up 450% in Zoom. This is so funny. What This is why, like, investing is so path-dependent. Because you could say, listen, you could invest in both of these, and I'll give you a 40% return two years later. Which one would you choose? And you say, 
well, it doesn't matter. I'm up 40% either way. But no one in their right mind would choose that Zoom ride Hell no. if you're a buy and hold investor and say, I was up 450% at one point. Now I'm up 40% of my holdings. Did you see somebody tweet the list of stocks that are down like 70% or more? It's a big list. There's there's so many of them. Um, this is a weird thing. Based on trailing PE, which is just one metric, but you know it's a it's an important one. Uh, Amazon has a lower PE than Walmart for the first time, probably ever. Connor said Sen did this tweet, and he looked at the EV to EBITDA multiples, which I guess is just a way. It's if you want to look smarter and say this is how like private investors would value these things. It's just another valuation metric. But he's showing that like Facebook, Amazon, Apple, Netflix, these are like comparable or lower now than Walmart and Procter and Gamble and Coke and Home Depot and IBM. It's <laughs> it's wild. So a lot of those names, the second group, are the ones. So you look at the net, the S and P, and you think like, how is it off nine percent? How it doesn't make sense when it's seemingly every name is getting killed. Every name is not getting killed. That's the thing. Names ten through twenty in the market cap weighted index. United Health, for example, a lot of these names you just mentioned, they're like doing just fine. And so it's stocks that aren't in the headline. That's that's the problem, right? Like no one, even Berkshire Hathaway with Warren Buffett is doing just fine. It's not a stock that's going to make headlines for people. Right, exactly. By the way, speaking of headlines, it is Monday afternoon. The Nasdaq is careening lower. It's almost down two percent on the day. It's so weird. I'm 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 watching crypto probably too closely, but Crypto seems to just be another, at least right now, it's just a risk on risk off asset. It is moving exactly in line with with the S&P or with futures, with risk on risk off. Bianco did a tweet, right? Well, we're going to talk about that later. Um, ben, any, any, any do, do predictions? To, any predictions? Where does the market I open mean, tomorrow? You, oh, okay. I, I, okay. So you're looking at the futures market. You're not looking at the, I was going to say the market is closed today, but you're just looking at the futures market. Yeah. What is that weird? Okay. No, I just wanted to make sure you weren't looking at the market from Friday. Oh, it's flat. Thinking that it's still, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, come on. I was teeing you up there. Uh, so, so you talked about stuff getting killed. So the the Nasdaq Composite I looked at down 15? is down fifteen percent. Fifteen percent. Twenty eight percent of the stocks in that are down sixty percent or worse. Sixty. Sixty percent or worse. Thirty five percent are down fifty percent or worse. Over one third of stocks are down fifty percent or worse. So you talk about like this whole thing about it's. I really do think it's just we got so enamored with these name brand stocks and seeing them get killed that it almost doesn't make sense. Is, the is the, it controversial to is, say, I think this is a bear market? It's a bear market for some people. If if you're not purely passive, this is – if you're if you're picking stocks outside of the Coca-Colas of the world, which is not what most people are picking, this is a bear market. And for basically everyone, everyone in 2021 – this is a brutal bear market. It's not even a bear. How, how about this? Dude, if the names that you're trading down 70%, that's not a bear market. That's annihilation. That's not a bear market. <laughs> for it's for the, growth it's, investors. It's the depression. Especially. Yes. So think about if you're if you're a person who went all tech, and I can't remember if we, were, we mentioned this, but we, we had question after question from people saying, should I go all in on growth? And someone emailed me a few weeks ago and said, by the way, just so you know, I went all in on growth stocks for the down payment for my house, and I don't know what I'm going to do now. <sighs> And so this is the thing, like, let's say, I mean, I'm sure how many tech people do you think have 100% of their portfolio in tech stocks and crypto? Yeah. And for them, it is, it's, it's, it's a, it's a huge crack because the S&P is down, I think 9.3%. Yeah. Forget the S&P. Uh, for, for, for a lot of people, this is not a bear market. It's way worse. You know who's sitting pretty? Target date fund investors. Boomers. <laughs> no, boomers <laughs> holding dividend stocks, right? Like have been ridiculed for years, but I mean, how many investors stayed with that type of strategy over the past few years when you saw all these growth names just going bonkers, right? So I'm, I'm guessing so many investors have shifted to that stance. It's tough. Did you see somebody had that tweet of, uh, I think it was labeled by the invasion, which I don't think this, I don't know what this person was intending to say. Obviously that sounds insensitive, but the point that they were making was that oftentimes stocks sell off it's like a it's like a uh, sell the news type of event, but in reverse, that stocks sell off. And then, did you see that chart? No, no, no I missed it. Okay. Explain it to me. It was basically showing that on the actual day of the invasion, going back to 
Iraq and a few other wars. Oh, okay. I got you. I, I've, I've written some about this. This this is one of those things where, like, if, if you're trying to use your geopolitical stature to to guess what's going on in the market, I mean, I don't mean to, like, sound insensitive, but what are ways that this could actually impact the markets beyond, like, a psychological toll of, okay, this is war, this is bad? Uh, I mean, because trying to guess, like, is it just energy markets and oil, I guess? Yeah, like, that's, that's the thing that could really roil the markets? Yeah, yeah. Cause someone tweeted this too that that the Texas GDP is bigger than the Russian GDP, and I'm like, that doesn't is that really true? That the GDP matter. of Texas is. I, no, I'm just yeah. saying that. So the GDP of Texas is two trillion dollars. The GDP of Russia is one point seven. Interesting. I'm just saying. Yeah, I, I'm just saying. Like, is is Russia still as big of a? Do they still have as much of an impact as they once did? Like, are we still holding like Russia high as like this this huge global power? like they once were when they just aren't anymore. Well, I can't speak to that, but what we can speak to is the fact that the market is already wobbly, right? And so it doesn't take much to really knock it over. But and you, maybe maybe you take- maybe this is the straw that breaks the camel's back because investor sentiment is already pretty negative. Um, or maybe not. Maybe this is where stock's bottom. Who the hell knows? But do, do you think the fact that the market isn't down more, it's down 9%, which is still below what the average intra-year peak to trough drawdown is, going back many decades. Do you think that is a good sign or a bad sign right now? Because there's the, the bad sign is, well, the generals get shot last, yeah, yeah. and those yeah, big yeah. names are going to yep, get crushed, yep, yep, yep. and then, then watch out, that's the next leg lower. Yes. Here, 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 or here's, is it like- here's what I will say. Every time we've been in this area where we've had the generals as the last one standing, and it was never to this degree. Over the last 10 years, we've never seen anything to this degree of the darlings getting beaten down this bad. But I still think that you have to give the secular bull market the benefit of the doubt. And I can be proven wrong in three days. Um, but until they get them, I think that this is a, a, a win for the bulls. But again, um, I'm not going to say that the, that the that Apples and Microsoft and Google can't, can't fall out of bed and drag the rest of the market down with it, the index levels. But we'll see. If, if, if this is a bear market, as you say... And this is the way it happens. And the S and P falls ten or fifteen percent, but hyper growth stocks fall fifty to sixty. Isn't that best case scenario? Well, the S and P's already down ten. So, but that's what I'm saying. Like, if 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 you're just a person who follows the overall stock market, that's best case scenario for you, right? That we we shook out all of the excess and all the speculation and the spacs and the IPOs. They all got crushed, and the stock market still. Had a correction, but it it's fine. Like I don't. That, yeah, I, I, I think hate, I hate for long term long term bull market thesis. That's a very good sign. I would say a, a correction only looks healthy in other people's stocks is is something that I've said before, um, and that's certainly the case here. But if not even if even if the S and P does enter a bear market, this is healthy, right? What m- yes. remember I wrote not not that you would remember. I wrote a post I think in December two thousand twenty called "This is not the way." talking about all this stuff and we've both written multiple articles and so has everybody else about how this cannot continue. The zooms going up every single day. Like it's so yeah, that easy. Was, that was not healthy. That was not healthy. Every, yeah. Right. Yeah, so I, I, I I'm not trying to, uh, I understand that this, this is painful for a lot of people, so it might not feel healthy, but for the overall the other, market, you need, you need to get rid of some of the excess sometimes. The other difference between this and the 99.com blow up was we're going to get to this in our great quarter section today. But a lot of these companies are still reporting fantastic results. Back then, the most of the companies did not have actual businesses. Like, in a lot of them got vaporized and just were gone forever, right? Obviously, some of them made it, but not many. The the ones we that made it, we still talk about Amazon and Cisco and stuff. That's like survivorship. The, there's a lot of them that didn't make it. These companies today are still posting fantastic results. It's just that expectations were so far out of whack. And I just I don't know that we've seen a market like this that i mean nifty 50 stocks back in the set like current investors have ever experienced something like this where you have such a wide range no, of outcomes no i was uh i was talking to josh about this if you just scanned a hundred charts pull up your favorite charts right without, without the indexes you would say vanguard 4045 yeah, exactly <laughs> <laughs> you would say, holy shit, the market must be down 30%, 40%. Yes. So maybe we get there, or maybe this was the washout, and then you know they come back. We'll, we'll see. Uh, all right. We- but hopefully most of our listeners that we've talked about over the years, we've said, listen, these people have Robinhood accounts that they're trading in, but they also have their 401ks and IRAs and all this stuff, and they have more of the normal stuff in there. Yeah. 
So m- maybe this is a good lesson because I have the Robin Hood account too. So do you. I'm getting crushed right along with these people. I sized it correctly for my personality and my risk profile and all that stuff. And well, not, not to brag, I have not grow to, stocks. Not, not to brag, I, I I took two stabs at Robin on the way down, and I've been pretty clean ever since. I haven't really stepped in. No, I mean I mean not like Robin Hood, the stock Robin Hood. No, I know I know what you mean, but I haven't. Okay. I'm not yes. getting killed. I don't own growth names. Oh, I, oh, okay. well, we all crypto. What? Same, yeah, cri- same, same, thing. same thing. Same thing. You're right. Um, by the way, I will. I'll step in. I'll step in. I'll buy some of these names when they stop crashing. Okay. See, I, I'm just a psycho, and I just hold the crashing stocks because I don't know. I don't. I don't have a stop. I don't know what a stop loss is. I guess. <laughs> um, last week we spoke. Did we talk about Robinhood raising their margin account interest interest rates? I don't think we did actually. No, I got an email about it too. So what it goes from two to three percent, basically. Yeah, so not a big deal. But my here's but here's the point. Uh, of course they did. I'm not. I don't blame them. Right, they're running a business. But if you look at there's, I can hear when you move your mic like okay, that. Okay, sorry. There's this beautiful chart. Uh, by the way, now the shoes on the other foot because you're Mr. Mike Mover. Uh, <laughs> there's this beautiful chart from Bloomberg showing the two year Treasury yield. And Marcus, which is a proxy, well, Marcus, the same, high yield savings account, I'm sure they all look the same. So there was a time where Marcus was willing to subsidize and take a loss on this as they were building up deposits. Now, they're smart. They know, good luck. You're not going anywhere for an extra 20 basis points. You're just not leaving. Maybe you leave, but everybody's not leaving. Uh, so now the two year has spiked and Marcus ain't budging. They're just not budging. But this is, this to me is like gas prices and mortgage rates. It's like a negative convexity. 100%. So, when oil prices rise, gas prices go up immediately, and they go up a lot. When oil prices fall, it takes a while to, for gas prices to fall, right? The 10-year is up. It's not up much, but mortgage rates have gone from like 2.8 to 4 in a like in a heartbeat. And how about the two-year like yield? They've gone way up more. the two-year more. yield. Yes. Raise our interest rates. If my kid wasn't sleeping in the room next door, I would be screaming right now. Turn my mic on! Yes, that's the thing. Like This stuff happens, and I, the, the, the banks are taking advantage, and they're going to charge 4% on mortgage rates now. And they went up way faster than any of the other yields did, especially like the longer term. Because guess what? A 30-year mortgage rate is not tied to the two-year bond. You know what fixes right? this? It's, you know what fixes this? What's that? Crypto. By the way, how great how great was our talk with Lee? Lee, Lee, yes. Drogan, so missed it. Lee Drogan manages a crypto hedge fund called Starkiller Capital. And he said, and I quote, I think the Fed does a great job. Yes. he. It, it's, it's one of the few... Ultra uber bullish, like Lee has gone all in on crypto, his career, his fund, his money. He's gone all in, but he is not a Fed hater. He doesn't think that like there's hyperinflation. He doesn't say he doesn't few. think that. <laughs> yes, he doesn't do the GM thing. He doesn't he doesn't think that we need this like permissionless decentralized world because blah, blah, blah. He's a libertarian. He is just bullish on crypto for what it can potentially do. And his whole thesis for it, I think, is very well worth listening to. So we, we talked to him. Uh, it came out on Saturday. And I, I think it's 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 worth a listen, especially the the whole idea of running a twenty four seven hedge fund to me, and with the, all the custody behind that and the DeFi and all the stable coins and staking all this stuff. It's yeah, very interesting. Um, okay, so someone shared this chart from Goldman. I I've, I think I've talked about this before. They they show the difference in net worth and asset allocation basically between the bottom fifty percent and the top one percent of households. So the bottom 50% has 55% in real estate and 4% in equities, right? The top 1% has 60% in equities and 11% in real estate, much lower, right? And we've spent years going over the fact that this is driving wealth inequality, right? We need more people to be in financial assets. I actually think because of the way the housing market is working now, this is going to actually make things even worse because so right now, again, housing is for the bottom 50%. That is their retirement portfolio in a lot of ways. That's their savings. They don't have a whole lot of other financial assets. Their primary residence is their financial asset. It makes up the bulk of financial assets for the bottom 50%. Because people with better consumer balance sheets and better credit scores and more money are able to now buy housing, I think this is just going to make things even worse where the lower 50% is going to be priced out of housing and stocks going forward. Why price out of stocks? Oh, because they just don't own stocks in general? They just own in stocks in general, right. and they haven't. But I'm saying over the course of this next decade, if my housing theory plays out and housing prices keep going up a little more each year, I think the bottom 50% is going to start being left out of the housing market as well, and that this is going to drive even larger gap between the haves and the have-nots. Could be. Yeah, this is this is a big and complicated ca- uh, topic. 
Like if you're if you're a person who already owns a home, you're doing very well mm. right now, right? You've been able to borrow at lower rates or refinance. Your housing price has gone up, but I'm saying for the people coming in, that next rung down who are trying to buy, and now housing prices are up so high. So you, you saw this Redfin report, right, about housing markets? Yeah. So there's just there's just not enough houses. So Bill McBride did this thing on housing inventory compared to 2020. Inventory is down 65 percent. 65 percent so this is by this is this is nuts by the way we're going to talk about this redfin data this is another stock so all of these stocks ben i did a post over the weekend there's so many stocks that were literally down 70 percent this going, redfin is down 76 percent going into earnings and then felt oh, okay. and then fell 20 percent on the day that they reported Redfin's another one. Redfin, Open Door, Zillow, in the best housing market ever. These stocks are getting annihilated. So here's some here's some- seventy. Yeah, that's that that's like the data. Like, it's it seems so dumb. Like, of course the math is obvious, but going from a sixty percent loss to a seventy five percent loss is not fifteen percent. It's forty percent, and that's wow. happening these days. That's like right. <laughs> yeah, it's common. <laughs> so all right, for the four weeks ending February thirteenth, a record. 57% of homes that went under contract did so within two weeks of being listed. 44% of homes Jeez. were accepted offers within one week. That's insane. Homes that were sold were on the market for a median 29 days. I don't see what all of a sudden makes this get better. Like I feel like this is going to take potentially years to happen, to, to, like, to get better. But it's not like you can just, especially since building a house right now is so difficult and supplies and labor is so hard. It's not like they're able to just pump out houses as fast as they can to, to like, right. this is going to be a multi-year thing where this gets better. It's not, and especially if you are looking to buy a house and like, like you're just going to keep getting more and more antsy about it and you're not going to like wait longer, Then you right? still think homes are too cheap? Relative to the demand, I think they are. I like the best time to buy a house is always five to seven years ago, pretty much in this country, right? Just about. And I think that you're going to look at the end of the decade and go, were housing, were housing prices cheap in 2022 compared to 2030? I think you're going to say yes. The median home sales price was up 15% year over year, up 30% from the same time in 2020. The median uh, mortgage payment, I mean, it's just these numbers are crazy. So here, here's a good analogy. Um, from Taylor Marr, the chief economist, I think at Redfin. Um, if you think that of the housing market like a bathtub, water, which is a supply of homes for sale, is flowing down the drain because buyers are sucking up supply faster than new water, which is new listings, is coming in through the faucet. Rising mortgage rates may slow the drain down a bit as record high monthly payments take a toll on the buyer's budget. But the bottom line is that without a flood of new listings, we will be sitting in a very shallow bath for a while. I think that's spot on. Where do these new listings come from? There are just more people that want a house than there are people willing to sell a house. And like I was talking to my wife this weekend. We were at my parents' house and talking to my dad about it too. I don't think you could give me a high enough premium in my house right now to force me to go through the buying process in this yeah, market. It would be so stressful and exa I feel so bad for people going through it because you could pay me 50% more than my house is worth today. And I'd probably say no because there's nothing else on the market for me to buy. And if I have to buy it, it's going to be hard to get it, and it's pro I'm probably going to have to make some concessions. Nah. And and I already have a three percent mortgage rate, and I, I just don't see. So they they had this other one: the monthly mortgage payment, the median asking price rose to an all time high of right around two thousand dollars for monthly mortgage payment. It's up twenty seven percent from a year earlier because rates are a little higher, and of course prices are going up. Again, I, I think this is going to drive the inequality thing because the people who have the money are going to be the ones able to buy the house. Right, because they're going to say we're going to we're going to get help from our parents, or you know, for a down payment, or you know, we have enough means to do it, and the people who aren't are kind of screwed. So this was another one from Bloomberg: homes valued at a million dollars or higher are now the norm in 481 cities in the U.S., more than double the number just five years earlier. Like basically, that's like how much you have to pay for a house a medium. But and it's not just San Francisco, New York anymore. They're saying that in like all these places in Montana, in Idaho, in Tennessee. Average housing prices are now up like forty to thirty percent, thirty to forty percent over the last year to a million dollars in some of these places that people are going to. 
it's here's another one. So did you listen to our friend Logan Motoshami on the New Bazaar with, with Cardiff Garcia? It's worth a listen. And he gives some other reasons for the fact that we're having low. Like we've talked about the fact that they didn't build enough houses after 2008 because the builders were all scarred. But he also says people are just wanting to live in the houses longer. So he said from 1985 to 2007, the average tenure in someone's home was like five years. Hmm. You lived in a house for five years on average. From 2008 to 2022, it's now 10 years. And of course, much higher in some places. And he's saying that's because houses are getting bigger and better. So the average new home in 1975 was like 1,500 square feet. Today, it's more like 2,500 square feet. And so people don't want or need to move as much. Plus, you actually had more people on average living in the houses back then than you do now. This is a great, I, I wrote this one a couple of years ago. Uh, credit to me for being so far ahead of the curve here. I wrote this, <laughs> sorry, I wrote this in 20, 2016. Has there ever been a better time to be a home buyer? And it was using data, and I wasn't even saying like it's a price call, but how many, how many, using how, da- how many houses did you buy? <laughs> 11, I wish. Uh, so in 1973, 49% of new homes had no air conditioning. 40% of new homes had one and a half bathrooms or fewer. By 2015, that number is 4%. Uh, in 1973, 23% of new houses had four bedrooms or more. Today, it's 47% with comes with uh, four bedrooms or more. The average size of U.S. household in 1973 was three people. It's not down to two and a half people on average. So we have bigger houses, better houses, more amenities, fewer people living in them. So people aren't going to be looking to move out of them as much because, so I, I don't know, I just feel like, we're going to look back on this period, like a 10 to 15 year period from call it like 2006 to, okay, maybe it's more like 20 years, like 2006 to 2026 or whatever, is going to be like the craziest housing period we've ever seen. I think it's like people are going to look at that crash and then the spring back in prices. But it's just bizarre to me how much luck is involved in the process. Like when did you buy your home? Like 2018? 2019. Yeah, I got super lucky. Good time. Like, we built in 2017, and the only reason we did it is because we were having twins. We we like we we could have made our other house work, I guess, but it was it, like the setup of the house didn't work. We had to move because we unexpectedly were going to have twins, and we built a new house. And the crazy thing is, the day we moved in, that house is brand spanking new. It's clean, untouched, you know, and the house is now worth 40 or 50 percent more, even though we've lived in it for five or six years. You know, we take care of it as much as we can, but kids live there. Like it's it's. <laughs> It's not like it's in as good a shape as it was back then. Yeah. It's like it, it, it's such a bizarre concept that housing prices, it's not like a car where you drive off the lot and it depreciates or whatever. Ben, we got an email. Um, this this person purchased a, a home, new construction, new development. Uh, there's 100 homes built in the neighborhood. Going through the mortgage underwriting and when I receive the numbers, what do I find? Title insurance. Uh, 1400 bucks. Now I ask you. Why do I have to pay for title insurance for a home that is brand new and being built in a new development that already has roughly 100 homes in it? That's a great question. <laughs> I, I, it would be nice if you just on principle, it's like, you know what? I'm not going to pay it. I'm fighting this. Yeah. Like someone, someone should do that. So you see this, this thing that Disney is going to be making their own neighborhoods, residential neighborhoods. I, I'm sure with all the crazy Disney people that have reached out over the last couple of weeks that people will buy. They're going to do it in, in California. Surrounding this like twenty four acre lagoon, I don't know what a Disney. It's called what's like a lagoon. Stor- what's what's Stor- a lagoon? Uh, like when I hear when I hear the word lagoon, I think <laughs> that's a good, that's water. A good question. I, I, I honestly don't know yeah. what a is it a cave? What's a lagoon? I think a lagoon is a pond with a good PR person. I like I don't I don't really know the difference. <laughs> but, <laughs> um, but they're gonna ha- call this like Story Living by Disney, and they're gonna design the. I mean. <sighs> What? <laughs> but the people are going to buy these, right? Like, I can't imagine. I don't know what it, if you Disney characters walk around the neighborhood. I mean, my easy, <laughs> my layup joke here is that, like, right? I, I try to come up with some good ideas for this. Like, if, if you're a single male living with your parents right now, like, you're going to live in the Star Wars community, right? Like, all single males should just move there. Um, I, 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 don't, I don't know what this is going to be. Oh, man. Um, all right, let's move on to bad quarter guys. <laughs> yeah, uh, there you go. Oh, my goodness. Uh, oh, Airbnb. That's the okay. first one wasn't bad. I, I listened yeah. to this one. This is this is a company. This is what I mean. They're not. I mean, they're a tech company in name only, I guess. But they're one of these companies that I think is going to be better because of the pandemic. We talked about some of these companies that like that's true are, are much worse off. Like 
before the pandemic, I never really looked at Airbnb. Like I would say, why wouldn't I just stay in a hotel if I'm going to go somewhere? Now, and maybe it's because of my place in life because I have a family, but if we're going to travel somewhere, I'm going to look at an Airbnb before a hotel even. Well, also, I, and the work from home, like that's a secular yeah, tailwind now. That that's did what not I exist. think. I think that's a, so I listened to the Airbnb call. They said that they, they did a lot of comparisons of 2019 pre-pandemic to now. And they said every single length of stay has gotten longer and more people are like people are staying for a month longer. But the only one that is shortened is a one night stay. And they think that's because that was all business travelers back in the day. And they don't have as many business travel. But but that whole thing of renting a place for a week or two with your family and being able to work, you know, you and I can do that. And a lot, not everyone has that luxury, but a lot of people can where they can go and they can have a work vacation. Is there a name for this yet? A workcation, something dumb like so this? The numbers, sure. the numbers at Airbnb were so good that the stock only fell 23% on the day after reported. <laughs> <laughs> what, yeah. what, did the, what did the stock do? They, they're surprisingly holding up okay. I think they're in like a 20% drawdown, so they haven't gotten completely crushed. They've, they've done okay. This, this is one, I think, I bought this right around the IPO. I think I bought it the day of the IPO, and they might be up a little bit since then. They, they're not... I don't, they're up twenty percent since the IPO. Uh, so, that's a so win. That's a win. So what? What? What are the numbers? Revenues up seventy eight percent year over year. Yeah, this, and, is, and this is a long runway. Yes, they've their their numbers were really good, and I, I don't know. I I just think like if you're looking for a good story for something that the pandemic has changed in a big way, they were basically saying our biggest thing we need to do is get more supply. Like we have more demand than supply. They have like four and a half million homes that people are are willing to rent out. They need to find more ways to get homes, basically. Good luck with that. Well, I think part of it could be if you're going to go for a month to stay somewhere for working and taking a vacation. Where do those people to, go? I'm saying to pay for that, you rent out your house. Oh. Uh, like, they're, okay. I think they're going to they're gonna have to figure out more ways of doing this. I just think, like, if, if nobody could find a home, I don't know if this is, like, a part of the same story or totally different, but how do they find more inventory? So do you think that they would ever get into the business like fundrise of building their own rentals mm, good question um I mean, obviously it's more capital intensive business did you listen to shopify i did listen to shopify <laughs> if you did not look at the share price of this company and just listened to the quarterly earnings call you would think this stock is probably up 100 percent this year so that's a great point you make i was reading through it and i'm thinking like obviously i don't know what the consensus was which was the issue but looks pretty good to me there it's pretty good to me <laughs> Their president, Harley Finkenstein, wrote a piece, just a summary of Shopify 2021 versus 2019. Annual revenue tripled to $4.6 billion. Uh, seven companies on Shopify IPO'd. Their merchant base doubled with 1 million new businesses launched on Shopify. He's saying the growth in commerce is alive and well. This company is down 52% this year alone. Just getting slaughtered. What, did, what was it down the day it came out? 20% almost after earnings? I don't, know, I, I don't know what it did after earnings. The stock. So we spoke about Shopify a few weeks ago. We're like, holy cow, Shopify. This is a real amazing business growing super quick. And I think we said the problem was it was trading at 60 times, which was obviously a problem. And I, I'm talking about sales. And now right. it was trading at 30 times, which is still, you know, it's not a bargain. Uh, now it's trading at 18 times sales. The, pro the problem is like fundamentals don't matter on the way down. Right. It's no, just these these stocks are in free fall and Shopify might be the buy of the century right here. But it can also fall another 30 percent. And those Easily. two things are not those two things are not like uh, both of those things could be true. Yes, it could be the next Amazon. I mean, that that's a but Amazon had its its own 95 percent. fall. Net, Netflix sold 80 percent. Like it's not out of the ordinary for a company like this to to see. A and this is their biggest decline. Ever. I think they're down 60 percent. Well, so what did, they, what, did, what, did, what did they say? They, they basically, I mean, what they said was their growth rates are phenomenal right now. They're not going to be as big next year as they are this year. I think that so was kind of what, okay. I think that's kind All of right, what so there it, it is. Was. Shopify beat on Q4 estimates, but said revenue growth of 2022 will be lower than the current 57% growth <laughs> right. due to the end of the pandemic e-commerce surge. So uh, profits rose 41%. Sorry, year we can't. Year. We, we can't raise. We can't raise revenue fifty-seven percent each year. I think it's basically that. Yeah, but it's in, investors are. This just, is this is a great chart. They showed uh, the share of U.S. retail e-commerce sales in two thousand twenty-one. They're second only behind Amazon. They're ahead of Walmart, ahead of eBay, ahead of Apple. I mean, this is a, this is a tremendous, tremendous company. Um, obviously, just got too expensive. And, and look at this chart. It, look at this chart. Look at this revenue growth. 
it was up like two thousand percent since its right. its IPO in twenty fifteen or something. So obviously it had it already had a ton of growth, and it just yeah. Oh, I didn't get to damn it! I meant to get to Walmart. I didn't get to Walmart. Uh, okay. Sam Rowe tweeted this: supply chain costs were over four hundred million dollars higher than expected at the beginning of the quarter, but gross and operating margins expanded anyway. Oh, okay. So I don't get how. Because a place like Walmart isn't raising prices too much, right? And their labor costs are going up, whoa, obviously. How, whoa, whoa. They, how does they that abso- happen? They, a- they absolutely are raising their prices. Okay, so even Walmart is raising prices a little bit. Dude, everyone's raising prices. Okay. And they actually did very well after the, after the earnings report. Roblox is another one. I think it was down, call it 70%, fell 20%. What, so what happened here? They did a direct listing uh, a year ago, about. Gun to your head. Could you explain what Roblox does? Video games. Is. Boom. I know. You, they do like th- it's it's just a video game though, right? Uh I'm not a Milan. I'm not not no, I am a Milan. I'm not a Gen Zer. Okay. I don't know. That's they, what I'm uh, they, I, they, I've they, heard they, of it, they, but they, I, do, they do dude, they do business. Come on. What else do you need to could, know? They do business. I'm just saying, could, could you pick this video game out of the lineup? I couldn't. Is what I'm saying. Well, let's get dunked on. Let's keep talking about Roblox and show our our ignorance here. It's got, it's a, 30, not, it's, it's got a thirty billion dollar market cap. Even but after Roblox, falling. Ro- Roblox is not a video game. A I, th- video game I company, thought. Sorry, I thought that they do a lot of the video game graphic designing. Okay, see, Am I, in the I don't know. I'm a video game boomer. I have no. I honestly have no idea. All right, I've heard of this company. I have no idea what they do. Revenue five hundred sixty eight million, lower than expected six hundred four. There it is. Uh they grew six in the range of sixty four to sixty six percent, which is again <laughs> astronomical growth. Maybe maybe these but CEOs eight- should just start bl- start blaming the analysts, saying it, this is your <laughs> fault for setting the <laughs> estimations wrong and the expectations. Screw you guys. The la- but the last report was eighty three percent, so their their growth is decelerating. What else is going on here? Daily active users grew thirty three percent to fifty million. Hours engaged grew twenty eight billion. So the fundamentals of the business. Are more than sound, right? We're looking at a chart of this revenue. I mean, we, would you invest in this business not knowing anything? Yes, but what you do know is that everybody knows these are great businesses, and they got bid up to infinity by the way, and beyond. So this is like a credit to us, but also a non-credit to us because I think there was a podcast a year or two ago, or a year or a year and a half ago, where we said, "Listen, the post-pandemic trade is going to be way harder than that during pandemic trade because during the pandemic trade, it was easy because you could see which companies were going to benefit." But the problem is like the timing on these things. We said eventually those COVID comps are going to be really tough. But sure. I'm sure that there was probably six months after we said that where these stocks kept going up anyway, and it didn't yeah. matter. And now it matters, and you're seeing these comps, and just like the timing on this stuff is so bizarre how it all just happens at once. So Roku, similar story. Uh, how do you do? You have a Roku TV? I don't. So I do. It's a okay. it's a beautiful system. Like the it, the remote you get. It has like five buttons on it, and it'll have like a Netflix button, a Hulu button. It doesn't have all the crazy buttons all these other remotes have. Yeah, I don't understand how they make money though. I guess it's content partnerships because it it's the, just the, it's just like an Amazon Fire Stick. Where well, it how has, much does the hardware cost? The hard, it's cheap. I, I got a Roku TV, and it was a six hundred dollar TV or something, a TCL, whatever. It's it's pretty pretty cheap. So I mean, they have their own station, and they, I'm sure they advertise, and then they have partnerships with all the places that put their apps on. I guess. But I don't get how it makes so much money. And this stock got crushed. Crushed. There's another one down 70%, fell 20%. Um, all right, last one. DraftKings. Another one down 70% going into earnings, fell 21% on the day. And investors. I'm sure they've been have... minting money too. No. DraftKings? No, I mean, they're losing. No, w- because. Oh, getting, because getting, they're trying to acquire customers? Yeah, getting. They're, they actually, they, I think they said they're going to lose. Don't quote me on this. Six to eight hundred million dollars this year. Okay, so they they basically need to be cons- some consolidation in the sports gambling space. Is that the problem? So investors are no longer willing to subsidize these money losing businesses. That's it, right? This everyone kn- knows what the story is with DraftKings. It's expensive to act, to acquire customers, and investors are saying, "Nope, not going to do it." All right, good. This was a good listener question on inflation. What is overpriced now that if we could just manage to wait 12 to 24 months, could be 20% cheaper or more? As companies are rebuilding inventories, perhaps overestimating demand, just like the ARC names did this time a year ago, what might be cheaper when disinflation kicks in? Obvious answer here is cars. What else? Mattresses and bedding, furniture. What definitely won't be cheaper? Fast food, et cetera. Oh, it won't be cheaper? 
No, he's yeah. What will and what? what there's, I mean, cars prices is the easy one. Prices, prices. I, I think aren't prices are down. pretty sticky. Prices aren't coming down on anything. I think yeah. I think it'd be hard for corporations to. Maybe there'll be more sales in the future. There's probably there probably has to be the fewest number of sales right now ever, right? For an item like where you get a discount. But I I can't if a corporation can raise prices for a year and consumers don't completely revolt. I don't know what would make them lower prices in the future. No, then I don't down. think Cars. I don't think there is. That's yeah. All right, uh, quickly. Um, J.P. Morgan says the metaverse is a trillion dollar per year market opportunity. Sure, why not? What do you think that meeting was like, <laughs> guys? What do you think the metaverse is worth? Yeah, a billion. Let's go, go with higher. the trill. Let's go with the trill. <laughs> Here's a quote: We are well positioned to bring together global trade and e-commerce. I'm sorry, and commerce across digital universes. All right, sure, why not? Um, <laughs> this was a really amazing, incredible, shitty headline. Sometimes, oftentimes, the internet is just a terrible place of misinformation, which uh, is unfortunate. Um, the headline from a Fortune magazine, like literally the headline was Warren Buffett just invested $1 billion in crypto. <laughs> What actually happened was Berkshire bought shares of a company, a Brazilian neobank called New Bank, which is basically like, imagine Berkshire buying shares in SoFi and the headline saying Berkshire buys $1 billion worth of crypto. But them actually buying a billion dollars in crypto at the same time Charlie Munger called, compared it to a venereal disease would have been perfect though. It's too bad it didn't happen. Who, with all due respect to Munger, who gives a shit what he thinks about crypto? Yeah, I, I just love the fact that at 98 years old, he's still just firing away. But yes, I, I, I don't not, think crypto also, people shouldn't who, care and neither uh, yeah, should finance Nobody people. should care. You shouldn't be insulted. Yeah. You should. I mean, but who cares? He's 98 years old. Like crypto is a thing for the 22nd century, perhaps. Right. Yes. I, I agree. Real quick. Um, half of all new Chevys, Fords, and Toyotas, and other major brands arriving on dealer lots in the next 90 days are already sold. Jeez. This sucks. Here's a shitty quote from the CEO of AutoNation. This tight inventory situation is going to be around certainly through the first half. I'm hoping we do see some improvement in the second half. Us too. That sucks. That really, really sucks. Do we have an update on the the, the, the chips for these things, these semiconductors? Still, Still nothing? I don't know what's I don't know. I haven't been following it closely. All right. This is this this was this is like the perfect poll for the internet era. American satisfaction of their personal lives and the direction of the US. So the percentage of people satisfied with their own personal lives and the way things are going is eighty five percent. The percentage of people satisfied with the way things are going in the US is seventeen percent. So everyone thinks my life is fine, the country is going to hell. Always. And, and if you look at if you look at this this chart. It's relatively stable at around 80% for people that are satisfied with the way things are going in their life. And it actually does jump around a lot. Hmm. In you can see, like in 2003, 70% of the country thought things were going well, which uh, was just horrible timing because the next decade was just going to be awful for the country. Yeah. Uh, but do, can you blame this on the internet? Is this just the way people think always? I think people are, people are often optimistic with their own life and bearish on the rest of the world. I think so. Too. I, that seems to be like a, a stance that would make you feel better about yourself. Ben, somebody emailed emailed us um, saying how he regrets basically all the time spent and wasted on speculation. Yes, I saw this. Um, so I wrote a post about it, uh, which you can read if you want. But somebody emailed me back. One of the things that I said was, oh, I'll just read his email. He said, I am stunned reading Michael's missive today in which you state, and this is a quote directly from me, would I trade stocks and buy NFTs if I wasn't sharing it on the show? Hard to say with certainty, but probably not. That's what I said. And this guy who apparently knows me better than I know myself said, I'm sorry. That is complete hockey puck. Is that a phrase, by the way? Hockey puck? This must be a Canadian. I don't know. I've never heard that before. You traded triple inverse ETFs a decade ago and you think you have exercised it out, exorcised it out of your system? Of course you would be trading now. Clearly you will have dialed down the exposure, but you would be making these trades. The market is your casino. This is not a negative take, just a recognition of who you are. You like the action. You know what? Good take. Good take. You agree? 100%. 
Okay. If anything, if anything, I'm more tempered, but that's not because of the podcast. That's just because of the business that we're in. Like I am much more responsible with my money now than I would be if I wasn't in the industry. I think that's like, that's obvious. It's a good way to put it. Like the way, yeah. In, in another life, you would have been gambling all your money maybe instead yeah, of having exactly. the majority of it on autopilot and invested in a more reasonable no doubt. manner. This, this, this person's right. Uh, guilty as charged. 